The Golden State Warriors even their series in the NBA Finals against the Boston Celtics. We dive into that. Adam Silver poses that maybe the NBA should shorten the season. ESPN analyst Richard Jefferson does not like it and has some strong comments about it. I don't like it either. When you talk about shortening the season, you mess with records. You mess with a whole bunch of things. And part of being a great player in the league is proving that you can do it on a consistent basis for a long period of time. He hit it right on the nail, bro. When you talk about LeBron James, Michael Jordan, these players were able to play at a high level for a long period of time. If you shorten the season, I mean, you just mess with too much. And I, you're giving the players the wrong idea, right? You're making them think that it is okay to take these days off. It is okay to go ahead and say, you know what? I'll skip out on some days. I'll take some rest days. That's not what they did back in the day. You're tuned into the new channel sports podcast. The ultimate sports talk podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 146 of the New Channel Sports Podcast. If this is your first time listening to this podcast, please do me a favor and go ahead and subscribe. You can do it on any major podcast platform available. You can also check out our website, newchannelsports.net. That's new channel spelled N-U channel sports.net. You can also subscribe there as well. Give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter. Check out our YouTube page as well. Myself and the at man, we plan on doing some good things on YouTube. So go ahead and check us out there. Check us out on Afro Vibes Television. Download the Roku app. Big Low and the Phenomenal One have been holding it down there for sure. I am joined by my marvelous co-host, Anthony, the at man. Belly, how are you doing, bro? Yeah, you... Caught me off guard with that marvelous thing, man. But uh, but I'm doing well. Um, I just want to quote the the late great Danny Green and just just say it, man. The Warriors are who we thought they were. We're gonna talk about it, but uh, I, I can't wait to get into it with you, bro. Yeah, we're we're definitely gonna get into it for sure. Did you not like me calling you marvelous? Is that is that too much for you? Or what, oh, what's up? Oh, oh, Mar- marvelous, marvelous was okay, man. But but it just it doesn't feel. Like I'm worthy of that after uh, marvelous Marvin Hag- Hagler, you know. Uh, I don't know if I'm quite up to the marvelous Marvin uh, status yet. So, uh, but no, I appreciate it, man. Marvelous will do just fine. Oh yeah, those are some big shoes to fill for sure. Uh, you kind of showing your age a little bit since you know a little bit about marvelous Marvin Hagler. But um, let's get right into the show, shall we? Let's start it off with a flashback. All right, so that was a flashback 22 years ago, June 4th of 2000, Kobe Bryant to Shaquille O'Neal in one of the most iconic moments in NBA history. The series came down to game seven between the Portland Trailblazers. The Lakers were actually up three games to one. They dropped the next two games. They actually were down by 15 in the third quarter. It looked like the Portland Trailblazers might go ahead and advance the NBA Finals. But instead, Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal put it together. They went on the run. The Lakers will hold off 89-84, to um, holding off the, the Blazers and, and outscoring them 31-13 to in the fourth quarter. Bryant finished with about 25 points, 11 rebounds, 7-6, to six and four block shots. The Lakers will go on to defeat the Indiana Pacers four games to two in the finals and claim its first franchise's championship since 1988. But that was definitely an iconic moment in NBA history and in Lakers history. 
I remember seeing that on TV. Kobe to Shaq. Shaq dunks the basketball. He's running back down the court. He's pointing to the stands. I don't know who he's pointing at, but he he's just going buck. And, and the Lakers crowd is going buck. It seems like the Los Angeles Lakers are kind of they're kind of spoiled a little bit. They have a lot of iconic moments in the history of the NBA. But that's a moment I will definitely never forget. Uh, do you remember where you were at, Ant-Man, when that happened? Oh, yeah, de- definitely do. I- iconic is definitely the only way to describe that play. I was a young pup uh, 22 years ago when that play happened. I was in L.A. Uh, I remember um, kind of sweating it, you know, being a Lakers fan, uh, high anxiety. And uh, and then this play happens, Kobe – uh, tosses this lob to Shaq. Shaq finishes at the rim, and I just remember running through the whole house, just just hollering with excitement, uh, ready to punch the ticket to the to the finals. At, at that point, it didn't even matter who who we were going to see. Uh, we had just we we made it through. Um, you just kind of felt like the momentum was on the Lakers side and was going to continue. And they did. They ended up carrying that into that Pacers series. And uh, yeah, such an iconic moment and it's a great moment for me as a Laker fan uh to experience that yeah man that that was no small feat for Kobe and Shaq and the Lakers to de- defeat that Portland Trailblazer team that team has Scotty Pippen Detlef Shrimp Steve Smith Rasheed Wallace Damian Stoudemire Jermaine O'Neal Arvidas Sabonis. I mean, that team was stacked. It was championship or bust for that Portland Trailblazer team. Can you imagine the course of history in the NBA if the Portland Trailblazers were somehow able to beat the Los Angeles Lakers and go on to the championship? I mean, that was a pretty good team. They had beaten the Minnesota Timberwolves three games to one. Then they beat the Utah Jazz four games to one. And then they would eventually lose to the Lakers. But that team was stacked. Scottie Pippen was trying to prove that he could do it without Jordan and actually lead a team to the finals. It wasn't meant to be. But that is definitely one of the more iconic moments in NBA history. Yeah, the the Blazers were stacked. The West was stacked. And isn't it kind of ironic, the irony in this thing? You know, we were kind of pointing out some of the ironies in, in today's NBA playoffs and uh, and how the, the finals shaped up. But the irony of the situation that Pippen's trying to prove himself through uh, getting to the final, leading a team on his own without Michael Jordan, and then loses in that uh, Western Conference finals to a player who ended up becoming almost a mirror image of Michael Jeffrey Jordan. So uh, just a little irony. It's something that I think about often when I think about Pippen with that Blazers team and, and, and how he was kind of he was stopped i mean that was kind of the end of it uh for scotty right there so yeah they will actually go to the playoffs the next season and they would face the lakers again i think in the first round and they got swept (laughs) by the lakers yeah yeah. the next season so yeah you're definitely right that was the end of scotty pippen and his run post jordan but you know that's our flashback let's get into game two of the NBA Finals, the Golden State Warriors, even the series with the Boston Celtics, it's one game apiece now. They win game seven, 107 to 88. They now flip things to Boston for game three Wednesday night. What I noticed in this game, too, was the defensive intensity that the Golden State Warriors came out with. We talk about their offense a lot, but in this particular game, it was the defense that solidified that game and they had their you know their patented run in the third quarter which bust the game open and there was no coming back for the Boston Celtics they didn't have an answer in this game but that defense man of the Golden State Warriors the refs let them play in this one I'll tell you that for sure it was really really physical and they were up in everybody's face they did not give Al Horford any kind of hope at shooting any threes I don't think he even shot a three in this game, too, even Steph Curry was up playing some some defense. And that was the main thing that stood out to me in game two was that fact that Golden State came out and they put that defensive intensity on the Boston Celtics. Um, Jalen Brown came out on fire. I mean, his hair was on fire in that first quarter and he was hitting everything. But after the first quarter, it was the Jason Tatum show pretty much. And, and nobody else 
on the Boston Celtics team could could really do anything. They couldn't really manage to score. In the first game, you had six different players in double digits for the Boston Celtics. And in game two, it definitely was not that way for the Boston Celtics. Um, it, it just seemed like, you know, like I said, the Warriors had them on clamps. There, there's nothing that they could really do. Didn't they have an answer? Jason Tatum scored 28 points and Jalen Brown had 17. Besides that, the next highest man was Derek White with 12. And everybody else was non-existent. If they want to win this series, being the Boston Celtics, they have got to get more players involved. They have to have the kind of contribution that they had in game one. And something that we've been talking about throughout the course of the playoffs, and is the turnovers. The Boston Celtics had 18 turnovers in this game. Last game, they only had 12, and that was definitely a, a big difference in, in game two for the Boston Celtics, and. Yeah, you, you kind of took the words right out of my mouth there. When I look at this game, the way that it's being officiated or, or the series so far should favor the Celtics and their physicality, which, um, you know, if you go on TikTok and you look at the uh, keys to victory that I put out for the Boston Celtics, one of those keys was going to be they have to play physical with the Warriors. And the one of those other keys was they have to limit the turnovers. They, again, this was an Oprah sweepstakes of turnovers, and they were just giving them out to everybody who attended. Uh, 18 turnovers is unacceptable. The Golden State Warriors did exactly what we thought they would do. They capitalized on turnovers. But it, on top of that, it, it it stymied any momentum that Boston could get going. Uh, then the third quarter run happens. Ten minutes into the or with ten minutes left in the fourth quarter, Boston pretty much put the white flag up, which was the opposite of what happened. Obviously, the lead was a lot bigger, but uh, Ime Yudoka, uh, uh, obviously surrendering game two, happy with the split, putting the bench in with ten minutes left in the fourth quarter, and uh, and Boston just really never had a chance. And Golden State made sure because they left <laughs> they left Clay and Poole. Um, in the game, I believe, for the majority of that fourth quarter as well to make sure that uh, Boston couldn't mount any kind of comeback against their bench. Um, the other thing is is the rebounds. And, and I think that uh, while Golden State only won that rebound battle by one in, you know, 54 to 53, I think it, it matters in a sense that uh, they're undersized. So they nobody expects them to be able to bang on the boards with Boston and, and the size of those guys, um, but but they're doing it. They're getting a lot of help from the guards that are coming in and uh, picking picking off balls. Longer rebounds are, are going to guards, and uh, and they're just really taking advantage of it, which is helping keep the, the, the their turnovers, which they had twelve. Um, most most teams can't survive a twelve turnover game. Uh, tonight, the Warriors were able to do it because. Uh, um, because they were able to keep the rebounding close and they were able to ca- capitalize on the 18 turnovers Boston uh, gave up. So that's kind of what I saw. That's 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 really my keys. I mean, yeah, we can we can talk about Steph had 29. We expect that. Uh, Jordan Poole, um, he had 17, but I think the biggest shot that he hit was going into the half, uh, hitting that shot from just around half court. Uh, I think that really just kind of blew the chase center up and and – just swung the game all the way over to the the side of the Golden State Warriors. Uh, we could talk about all that stuff, but I think you and I pretty much had the feeling that Golden State was going to come out here and and uh, and flex their muscles a little bit at home and and get the series into a split, a one one tie. So that that's that's how I saw it. Yeah, that's that's definitely what I thought they were going to do. They came out, the game was close for the most part for that first half, then. The Golden State Warriors run that run that they're known for, that third quarter run. The good news for the Boston Celtics is that they were able to split the homestand for the Golden State Warriors. The bad news for the Boston Celtics is that, to be honest with you, I haven't really seen the Warriors play that well offensively. Besides Steph Curry, who has been going off, Klay Thompson hasn't played that well. He It took him a long time to get going in this game, in game two. He didn't really get going until the game was kind of really out of hand. The same thing with Jordan Poole. He didn't really get going until the game got out of hand as well. So when you look at these first two games, the only offensive weapon that the Golden State Warriors have really had has been Steph Curry. Steph Curry has been carrying them offensively these first two games, 
and Clay Thompson hasn't been on, and Drew Wiggins hasn't been on, uh, Jordan Poole hasn't been on. So if the Golden State Warriors are to really pull off this win and get a victory in the NBA Finals, I do think that the supporting cast is going to have to step up in these next two games in Boston and really provide more scoring besides Steph Curry, Ant. You hit the nail right on the head. Uh, Steph Curry can't do this by himself, although it would be incredible, right? I mean, what's the one thing he's really lacking on his resume as an MVP, a finals MVP? And, um, you know, so far, if this continues, if his play continues and and the Warriors go on to win this series, I don't see how he's not a unanimous finals MVP winner. Um, Obviously, there's still a lot of basketball potentially to be played so anything can happen but but just looking at it right now it's going to be tough in Boston like I said the way that this series so far has been officiated all the advantage in that respect goes to Boston because the Warriors don't play physical very well but Boston's got to stop beating themselves that's the bottom line but Bo- Bo- we said it in the previews going into the finals we said it at the end of game one that they cannot beat themselves with turnovers and sure enough, in game two, that's that's what happens. And now they got to go back home where they've struggled in, in uh, round two and round three of the Eastern Conference uh, bracket. Really, Boston has got to hope for another split in order to stay in this series. I, I think they'll get it. But 18, you can't have 18 turnovers, man. You can't you can't give you can't gift the, the Golden State Warriors uh, the ball like that. that. That just can't happen. I, I don't care who's scoring. I. I I don't care. I mean, I could live. I could live with Steph scoring twenty nine and nobody else doing anything. You can't turn the ball over eighteen times and beat this team. No, it's not going to happen. And I think you're underestimating the physicality of the Golden State Warriors coming into this game. Boston Celtics was ranked number one defensively, and Golden State was ranked number two defensively. So it's not like Draymond Green and those guys can't play physical basketball. They were definitely playing physical basketball in Game Two. And like I said, that's the main thing that stood out for me. The difference between game one and game two was the physicality of the Golden State Warriors and the way they were able to close out on those three-point shooters of the Boston Celtics. It was night and day as far as the three-point shooting for the Boston Celtics in this series. If the Golden State Warriors can continue to do that and limit the three-point shots that the Boston Celtics take, then like we said from the beginning – I still see Golden State winning this series, Ant. Everything we talked about is pretty much playing playing out. Uh, I kind of disagree with the physicality part, but I I, I kind of understand it also. Outside of Steph and Clay, I think the rest of that team is capable. I, I will I will concede that. I just see Boston being the much more physical team out of the two. No, no, you're right. Um, I expect them to. No. I expect them to play physical, but I'll, I'll concede that. I'll concede that game two, some they were able to to match. Some of bosses for you. I'll, I'll, I'll concede that much. Um, yeah, I think this series is going to end up exactly how we talked about, though. Oh, I think uh, I think so far it's it's kind of following that trend. I still got Warriors and six. I'm not going to back off of that. Although although early on, I was kind of like, ah, maybe I should have taken Boston. But, but <laughs> Golden State came through. But WNBA star um, Brittany in the giant, the sleeping giant. Well, those giants seem to be awake. Yeah. And uh, and game three is going to be exciting because now now both teams have something to play for. Exactly. Right? Tonight, we saw Golden State come out with, with kind of like a an urgency. Well, Boston's got to come out and play with that same urgency in game three. Exactly. The pressure to me in game three is on Boston. The Golden State Warriors, they lost game one and they came out exactly the way I expect them to come out in game two, being champs and all. And being favored to win this series, they came out and they made a statement in game two. Now I do think that the pressure is on the Boston Celtics to win game three. Because if they go into Boston being the Golden Celtics, I mean, the Golden Celtics. If they go into uh, Boston (laughs) being the Golden State Warriors and they're able to win game three, man, the amount of pressure that's going to be on Boston to win game four is going to be enormous. So we shall see what happens, Ant-Man. I'm excited. It's Wednesday, right? Oh yeah, Wednesday that, night, game, baby. Game three on Wednesday. Yep. Wednesday night. Yep. I mean, I'm so excited, far, huh? you, this is this is playoff basketball. Oh, absolutely. Right I, it's living up to the billing, right? That, I would say that. Absolutely. I mean, we're we're seeing Jason Tatum 
played his butt off in game two. And I, I just I really enjoy seeing him evolve as a basketball player during this run in the playoffs. And it, it's been good to see. Game three should be must see TV because that's that should be a good one. All right. So on to our next topic of discussion. This past Thursday, prior to game one of the NBA finals, um, Adam Silver was having his annual press conference and he dived into a lot of things. Right. He talked about changing the way the league does voting for all NBA teams. He talked about parity in the league. He also dived in a little bit about WNBA star Brittany Griner, who is still detained in Russia and has been detained for at least 100 days now. Um, Silver said that the league is working in lockstep with the U.S. government to gain her release. We all hope that that happens soon. Um, He also talked about the fact that there are 15 black head coaches in the league now, and that's half the teams in the league. Silver said he was encouraged by the progress, but still wanted to be dedicated up and down organizations, not just by race, but by gender. This is what Silver had to say. You have to talk about these issues all the time. If you care about diversity and inclusion in your workplace, you've got to look at the data. You've got to constantly present it to your colleagues, to your department heads, to your teams, and it has to become a focus. The goal is that that's not newsworthy and that when people are hired, the first reaction isn't the color of their skin. So he died into a lot of things during that press conference. But the main thing I want to discuss, Ant, is a discussion of the notion of shortening the amount of games in the league. And this is what he had to say at the press conference. I'm not against potentially changing the format of the season even me, even possibly shortening it a bit, if we can demonstrate that that's going to have a direct impact on injuries. And for example, last season, we, we played 10 fewer games and essentially had no impact. We want to make sure we have a system where our best players are incentivized to be on the floor. At the same time, we obviously don't want to see them injured. And so what we're hoping is we can all work collectively the 30 teams together in a non-competitive way together with our players association and figure out what is optimal on these players' bodies so that they're incentivized to play but aren't overdoing it to the extent where they end up playing too much and and pushing through injuries that, that ends up hurting their careers. All right. So that's what Adam Silver had to say as far as what it would look like if the league decided to shore in the season. And he was really concerned about injuries and the toll that a long season has on players. But he also mentioned that the year before, during the pandemic year, they did shorten the league, the, the games 10, 10 games, and there were still injury issues. Now, ESPN's uh, Richard Jefferson was asked about this and his opinion about it, and he and he kind of went off, man. He, he went off. This, this is what uh, Richard Jefferson had to say. I think this is absurd. I think this is let me, let me let me I just got trash here. This this is this is this is my issue right here, right? Is that you have game readies, you have norma techs. There was years ago where players used to not travel. They would not travel uh, commercial. We have eliminated back to backs. We now have a, a week long all star break instead of instead of like three and a half days. Yep. And I remember guys used to have to catch flights, play the last game on Thursday, play in the game on Sunday, and then you would have a game on on Tuesday, Wednesday. They have done every single thing. Every team now has sleep staffs. They have extra training staff. You want to shorten the season? Like, how much more do we have to make this coddling and all of this stuff go with the players? It makes absolutely no sense. Professional sports is not good on your body. It's supposed to separate the people that can do it from the people that can't do it. And while we do want our best product on the floor, part of greatness is longevity. That's what Michael Jordan, that's what that's what Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, that's what LeBron James, all of these guys, we talk about their greatness over a long period of time. And to keep eliminating this and dialing back to the point where it's like, there's nothing else for the players to do. I think it is a joke. I think they should never do this. Now, if you were talking about the in-season tournament, I think that's 100% maybe if you wanted to just have a little bit more space. But this right here is the epitome of coddling players to make sure that everything is okay on top of the fact that players are taking rest days 
on top of the fact that they're taking rest days right now. So how are you going to give them rest days and then say, well, we're going to shorten it to 60 games. We're going to shorten it to 70 games. At the end of the day, they're still going to take time off. Tell them about the money. The they're money. Making. Oh, they're making <laughs> all that you. money. I don't I'm think sorry. anyone else is going to be at the team, These are the teams. These are the owners need to get on these. It's not just the players. Thank don't say you. the players. It's literally, I've seen guys have a thumb injury and not be able to play in back-to-back because they didn't want their conditioning to be off. Right? Like, if you have a thumb injury, you should be in conditioning. And I'm going to stop because I'm getting too excited here. But the fact that we want to talk about shortening the season now with all of this stuff, you tore your ACL. I've missed time before this. And it ain't just because of that. If guys aren't conditioning 24 hours a day to make sure that their bodies are taken care of, that's on them and that's on the team. But shortening the season, you're going to mess with records. You're going to mess with numbers. You're going to mess with so much of our basketball because this group or the way that's handled right now can't handle it. I'm off that. All right. So, Richard Jeff went in bro he went as far as it said say that the nba is coddling players if i was an nba player right now i'll be pissed off at richard jefferson but hey bro i see no lies in what he's saying man i really don't when you talk about shortening the season you mess with records you mess with a whole bunch of things and part of being a great player in the league is proving that you can do it on a consistent basis for a long period of time. He hit it right on the nail, bro. When you talk about LeBron James, Michael Jordan, these players were able to play at a high level for a long period of time. If you shorten the season, I mean, you just mess with too much. And I, you're giving the players the wrong idea, right? You're making them think that it is okay to take these days off. It is okay to go ahead and say, you know what? I'll skip out on some days. I'll take some rest days. That's not what they did back in the day, Ant. And for this to even be considered, and then you see that they did limit some of the games and there was no change in injuries, then that, that is what it is. Oh, man, I, I, I can't agree with him more. What do you got to say about that, Ant? First off, I got to say that I could tell that you can't agree with Richard Jefferson more because you just matched Richard Jefferson energy. And that was amazing. Oh, I I felt it all the way here in Austin. I mean, you went, you went in just like Richard Jefferson. I was just, I was just matching the energy, bro. Uh, I was just matching the energy, bro. That's all I was doing. uh, The NBA has a huge problem with their stars sitting out. I think that they're trying to figure out how to deal with it, but nobody, nobody wants to do the hard thing and tell star players that in order to earn their money, they need to be on the floor playing. And I think that's kind of where Richard Jefferson is, is going in a way. Here's a little history because he talked a lot about the history, the old heads, the, the players that came before a lot of the greats, the Oscar Robinson's, the Michael Jordan's Larry magic, Kareem, all Wilt, all those greats, right? They're all out there. Dwayne Wade played with injury. Kobe Bryant played with injury. I mean, these are guys that that regardless of what their body was saying, if they could get on the floor, they were on the floor. There's not many of those that exist today. So here's some of the history. So in the the lowest number of games that the NBA uh, has ever played in a standard or a regular NBA season was 1961-1962. They played 80 games. We're talking 80. It's 82 right now. So they only increased to 82 games. In 66-67, they went to 81. And then from then on, 67 to 68, they went to 82. That's what they said. They said, we're settling on 82. Before the bubble... You know, before the COVID shortened season and then the the, the uh, following season when they had to give players enough time to get into an off season and, you know, their team workouts and all of that stuff. The shortest season that ever happened prior to the two COVID affected seasons was the 1998-1999 season it was 50 games. So 82 games is pretty sta- – I mean, 80 games is pretty standard for the NBA. They settled on 82. Okay, whatever. Major League Baseball players play 162 games, and I have not read or heard anybody complain about the length of that schedule and and shortening it. So uh, I think that Richard Jefferson has a huge point here. I think that, again, I keep saying the NBA today is soft. It's as soft as it's ever 
Man. You got, we just talked about one of those players in a, in a Kevin Durant that tends to be a little soft. And by the way, everybody better keep, I thought the next Twitter beef was going to be Kevin Durant and Shannon Sharp, but this certainly feels like Richard Jefferson might be in the crosshairs. Uh, I see Kyrie coming after Richard Jefferson for this because Kyrie is one of the biggest game managers, load managers. Quiet Leonard is another one kind of started the whole load management uh, movement. I mean, it, it, load management is disgraceful to the players that came before. It's disgraceful to the fans who pay good money and it's disrespectful to the businesses who sponsor the league. So yes, the NBA has a huge, huge star problem with you know the, a problem with stars sitting out and they don't know how to fix it shortening games not it i'm not sure putting a a, a midseason tournament is is the answer either i in fact i absolutely hate that idea I, I i can't i don't even i can't even believe richard jefferson can't believe we're talking about shortening the season i can't believe we're talking about mid-season tournaments it's it's ridiculous oh so i'm right there with you i'm right there richard jefferson and listen the worst thing that i want to hear one last point the worst thing i hear is people talking about injuries and and all this going on in the league and how we got to try to protect players more. And in the same breath, they'll talk about how today's NBA players are so great because of all the training they have, because of the travel schedules, because of all the money they make, because of the diets that they keep, because they can hire their own chefs. Oscar Robinson didn't hire his own chef. We just talked about it on the last show that Michael Jordan didn't reach a billion dollars when he was actively playing, probably because that kind of money wasn't going around in the league at that time. So all those people out there, I mean, it's, they, they don't realize they're contradicting themselves. You can't have it both ways. You can't say today's athlete is more superior because of all the things and all the advantages they have. And then turn around and say, Oh, well they're hurt too much. We need to shorten the season. It just doesn't make any sense. So I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with Richard Jefferson and uh, the NBA has got a problem, man. And I, and I don't know. I think that this is a, a reaction more than anything. They just don't know how to fix this. Yeah, I, I don't think it's gotten to the point to where it's actually a problem, though. I think the NBA is really good at trying to address issues, and I think they're really good at making sure they, they make the right choice. Now, I don't know how seriously Adam Sandler, I don't start to say Adam Sandler, bro. Adam Sandler is the commissioner of the NBA. <laughs> oh, boy. Would, would that be a fun NBA? No. That would be a fun NBA. No, Adam Silver. I don't know how serious he is about actually shortening the schedule, but I think the NBA is really good at addressing these things and trying to make the right decision. And you said it correctly, Ant. The league is so advanced. They do so many things already to try to prevent injuries. I don't think that shortening the season is the answer. The league, like Richard, Richard Jefferson said, is supposed to be hard on your body. The longevity of the regular season is what separates, you know, the regular players from the decent players, the decent players from the good players, the good players from the great players, and then the great players from the absolute best players. So if you take that away, right, you miss out on a lot of what makes the NBA the NBA. You miss out on a lot of what makes players have a legacy in the league so i don't think they should touch this the regular season they shouldn't shorten it let's just keep it as it is but i do think they should look into other avenues to try to limit the injuries and that's that falls on the players as well one thing that richard jefferson said is conditioning are the players doing the best that they can to condition their bodies and prepare themselves for the season ahead and I think that was a very, very, very important thing that he said. And we got to look into that and take that into account as far as what these players are doing to today in today's league, because they have everything to their advantage as every year goes on. And as er every error continues to go on, they have more and more benefits that help them with their longevity in the league. That's right. Players have to take responsibility for their own health and well-being. We have to do it in our normal jobs, in our daily lives. They're certainly making enough money to have all the advantages. We've talked about one quote unquote superstar quite often. Uh, it's the guy that's in, currently in Philadelphia, just left uh, New, uh, Brooklyn um, uh, before going there. Uh, the other guy in Brooklyn that didn't play an NBA minute 
Um, you'd all, yes, you have those players and, and those players are going to give, uh, the rest of the, like the LeBron James's who do spend my, I mean, LeBron James spends an extraordinary amount of money to stay, stay healthy. Uh, something that AD should probably take a look at Zion Williamson should probably take a look at it. Uh, and, and, and I hope, I hope that young kid, uh, makes some strides in that because I think he has the potential to be a really great player. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think players need to take responsibility for their own health and well-being. It's their role or it's their responsibility under contract to make sure that they can perform mm -hmm. for the money that they're being paid. It's, it's because they're getting paid out outrageously high. I mean, ticket prices are going up and, and I'm not going to knock anybody for making th that kind of money. It's, it's earned, but earn it, let it be earned, get on the floor. That, right. That's all I got to say about, I mean, that, it, that just kind of simplifies it. The, the players have to take some responsibility. Yeah, I agree. But to be fair to a certain degree, I just think that you can do all the conditioning you want, for some players, some players are just injury prone and that's just the way that it is. All players aren't built the same and some players come into the league and they, they work as hard as the next player, but they're just injury prone. And that's just the way it is. You know, some, a lot of great players careers have been cut short because of injuries. Oh, great. Greg Odin. Could you imagine what he would have been? Right. Brandon Roy, Brandon Roy, I mean, Grant Hill. Whew. Grant Hill, yeah. Anthony Hardaway. It, the list goes on and on. It does. Yeah. It absolutely yeah. does. It absolutely does. All right. Great stuff, Ant-Man. This see, you you lived up to the marvelous today. You really did. You you, you lived <laughs> up to it. That. You did. You did. I appreciate that. Man. That that was that was great stuff. I, I hope I hope I made Mr. Uh, marvelous Marvin proud. Wherever <laughs> he is, if he ever listens to this. If you enjoyed this marvelous episode of the New Channel Sports Podcast, please do me a favor and subscribe. You can do it on any major podcast platform available. You can also go to our website, newchannelsports.net. That's new channel spelled N-U-channelsports.net. Subscribe there as well. Give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter. Check out our YouTube page, me. And the Ant-Man, we're going to be doing some big things on YouTube here in the next couple of weeks. So check us out on YouTube. Download the Roku app so you can check us out on Afro Vibes Television. Big Low, shout out to Big Low. Shout out to the Phenomenal One, Chris. They've been holding it down on Afro Vibes Television. Check us out there. Um, did I miss out on anything, Ant? Did I, did I miss anything? They want to tell the people. No man, I think I, I, I'm I'm excited. I'm I just want the people to know how excited I am, uh, being the newest member to this already accomplished new channel sports podcast. Uh, I'm excited to to be doing this with you. Oh, it's it's been awesome, and uh, and I hope everybody is is just really getting hyped and really getting excited for all the things that that we have in store for them. Absolutely, so, uh, very well said. Until next time, we are out. Thanks for listening to the New Channel Sports Podcast. If you like the show, feel free to leave a comment and a five-star rating. Your support is very much appreciated. Also, don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, or on our website, newchannelsports.net. That's new channel spelt in you, channelsports.net. Got a sports-related question for the crew? Just leave a voicemail on our website. Till next time, have a good one and stay safe out there.